So, you want a Magpar PvP build, huh? You probably want one that has huge burst damage, good sustained damage, even one-on-one -on -one capabilities. You'll also want something that's very tanky. And high healing, am I right? But can you get all this in one build? Yes, this is my most powerful Magpar build yet. And I'm going to walk you through this step by step. This build is very simple to play, not overly complex. It works in Cyrodiil, Battlegrounds, Imperial City, and I even have a gear loadout for no CP PvP. This build is going to work in this update 33 and any going forward. And it has worked in the past, and I just made some small adjustments, and it's absolutely incredible. Let's get started by me jumping in-game and explaining why the Magpar is currently S-tier in ESO PvP and how you can take advantage of its strengths. All right, we're here on the Magpar. It looks a little different. Yes, a Magic Templar with a 2H. So I'm going to walk you through and explain why the 2H, why the Magpar is so strong, and how this build centers around its strengths, not its weaknesses. So here's the skill. The number one most important thing to understand about the Magic Templar right now is its survivability mechanism with Living Dark from Dawn's Wrath. This puts a bubble on. Okay, you get healed every half second for an enormous amount. If we look at unbuffed here, I'm at 2757. Also has a snare component with it. Also procs the Dawn Wrath passives like generating ultimate via prism here. And also procs casting a Dawn's Wrath ability grants minor sorcery. So Living Dark is your number one survivability mechanism. How Living Dark works is it scales in effectiveness off spell damage. Magpars should know this your number one thing to do is pump up spell damage because of this and its scaling. You do very well with a massive amount of spell damage. So we already talked about how to get some of that. Illuminate, so using a Dawn's Wrath ability like Living Dark is going to proc a minor. You can get major from Degeneration here from the Mages Guild, giving you a nice dot, giving you some good passives on the front. Now you have minor and major sorcery getting a massive amount percentage to spell damage, but we're not done yet. We go into Adric Spear here. The Balance Warrior passive increases your weapon and spell damage by 6%. So that's a flat rate that increases it. And then with this build specifically, I do use one medium uh, piece of armor because you get a increased spell damage 2%. Not a little whole lot individually, but you can see all of these combined with each other gives you a crap ton of spell damage leading to your main survivability mechanism, Living Dark. So why a two-hander? There's a bunch of different options in what you use and why. So we start with the traditional lightning staff. This is still a decent option. You have range and it increases your AOE damage abilities by 10%. So thank puncturing sweeps type thing. It's not nearly as good as dual wield or 2H. So if we go to dual wield, the reason you would use this primarily is twin blade and blunt. So if I took two points of this passive and we read it, each sword increases your weapon and spell damage by 142, or you can go with maces and you get increased penetration by 1650. So dual wield with two weapons, your main hand is your predominantly uh, best one to use. Usually you go with sharpen in the main hand and then charge in your offhand. The reason you go with charge, you're not going to get much bang for your buck with using Nurn or Sharpen or another trait. But with charge, you can get a lot of bang for your buck and using the Burning Enchant. So why do I go with a two-hander then? Okay, so the two-hander has a couple of unique, interesting mechanics that Dual Wheel does not. Number one is the follow-up passive. Bully charge, heavy attack, direct damage attack within seven seconds, deals increased 10% damage. So you combine this in your combo, fully charge back, and then bang, you're actually gonna see the proc effect before the fully charge heavy attacks lands. So look in the bottom of my buffs. I wind back a fully charge, it procs right there. You see that follow up passive, it has a sword and the fist right there? It actually procs right before it even lands. So it's your kind of your combo is you get that proc and then you do a crescent immediately as, as you see that. And you get 10% more damage from your crescent, which is AOE, very, very low cost. That's one advantage of the 2H, that fully charged heavy attack mechanic. And then right into a sweeps or a jabs, things just melt. The other advantage uh, to the two-hander is this one. Uh, using two-hander weapon increases your stamina recovery by 30% for 10 seconds after killing a target. It's just with a two-hander equipped. It's not having a two-hander ability active. Meaning you're going to get a ton and ton of stamina, which is going to play into our gear decisions later, specifically well-fitted. 
We survive a lot by doing dodge rolls. Yes, this is a magpar, but it's basically hybridized with the way the game works currently. So you're going to get crazy amount of stab recovery while you're killing stuff. You're going to have the ability to have a really, really good burst mechanic if you time it right. Not to mention the other uh, reason you would use it is here, the heavy weapons bonus. You can go a couple different routes on this. Two really strong choices, sword versus maces. Sword's going to give you 284 increased spell damage. We already talked about how useful spell damage can be. While mace is going to give you an enormous amount of penetration. 3300, in fact. So, you have two choices to make. The sword is going to increase your spell damage. That's also going to increase your effectiveness of living dark. Maces and penetration is going to be the most damage possible because penetration scales so effectively in terms of damage. Now, the more damage you do, ironically, the more your puncturing sweeps heals you. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, this is why I go with the two-hander. This is the premise behind it. You can run a lightning staff, you can run dual wield, or you can run two-hander. There's no wrong option. Now let's talk about the rest of the skills quick. This is pretty much the same bar I've run for years and years and years. So we're using top lean charge as a gap closer. So it hits very hard. It stuns enemies and sets them off balance. The thing you need to know about the off balance is the trick. It has a little swirly around their head. Okay. Why that's useful when you set off balance, you can go to your back bar and do a resto staff and get twice the resource sustain. So let me show you this when I'm about out of gas. One. Okay, I have basically have zero magic. Let me cast a skill again. And then we're going to top lean charge, go to our back bar and see how this works. Off balance, one, two, boom. Look how much magic I got. Roughly about 10 to 12,000 magic off the fully charged heavy attack off balance combo. So not only is top lean charge incredible for stunning opponents, movements, but that off balance is the key to giving your resource sustain. Next ability up is Purifying Light. This is going to soak up damage for a limited amount of time, like a balloon. And the balloon's going to pop doing tons of damage. You'll notice I don't have an Execute on my bar. This kind of acts like an Execute. I want to keep the build extremely simple. If I have three, four, five, six dots I'm maintaining, I'm not able to do that with three or four people beating on me all the time. So really, it's loading them up with damage. And then boom, this pops while I'm doing a sweep. It's too much to counter. Another advantage of Purifying Light is it attaches a heal mechanism to that thing that blows up. So if you don't kill someone, especially in a duel 1v1, it's cranking out tons of heals per second on you. Combine this with Living Dark and you're going to have an enormous amount of heals per second. That's why when you see me fighting these uh, outnumbered fights in the trailer, my health bar literally doesn't move with three people beating on me. Because I have so much heals per second with Living Dark and Purifying Light constantly active, they're not going to touch me. Next ability up is the generation from the mages guild. So this is your major sorcery buff. You can get this using potions and some other different ways. So feel like this is your flex spot on your front bar. You can use a million different abilities that you want. Maybe another dot, maybe inner light for more max stats. I like the generation because it's a hard hitting damage over time effect. So it leads into my purifying light, soaking up damage. And typically what I cast um, second or first, depending on what's going on in the fight. You want to maintain this and you want to maintain on your priority target that you have purifying light because it will believe it or not it will soak up a lot of damage and when that balloon pops with purifying light after six seconds it will go boom another reason to use it is after casting this you're going to get an empower so how this would work is you cast a generation close the gap with a fully charged heavy attack to get the follow-up passive which we've already talked about adding increased damage and then hit a crescent so they work in tandem with each other the generation fully charged heavy attack now that heavy attack hits for 40 percent harder and then now your crescent sweep hits for 10 percent harder you're just using the game's mechanisms to take advantage of as much damage as possible now the no-brainer here puncturing sweeps adric spear ability what can i tell you about this the only thing i can tell you about this is the harder this hits the more you get healed for and how to aim and kind of mess with this so i've learned something recently is kind of fast jab so how i've been doing it previously as i go like this kind of wait for the whole animation to come but you can do it much quicker with a light attack weave. And that's when your leg is shifting up, your right leg is starting to shift up. Then you click it and start your animation right then. And it'll cut the animation down significantly, allowing you to do a lot more damage. Let's see if we can do it here. Leg comes up, start it there. Leg comes up, you see how it's almost much faster? You can't even see the attack. So as soon as the leg starts coming up, you do the fast jabs. And also where you aim it. Remember the more targets you hit, 
the more healing you get. Sounds very simple, but where you point and aim this thing is the difference between hitting one target and maybe three. So work on the fast jabs, and when the leg is starting to come up on the right-hand side, that's when you'd use your light attack, and that's when you use your next ability to light attack cancel it and save a lot of time on the animation of jabs. Okay, we've talked about living dark again. Um, this is the basic bread and butter of survivability. We've already gone over that, but it's tricky. It's six seconds, and it has a ton of magic costs associated with them. So my gear choices are gonna amplify spell damage to take advantage of this, but not just strictly spell damage. Think of it kind of like a magic sword. If extremely high skill cap player picks up a magic sword, they can maintain a six second buff, no problem. The average player might have trouble. The player that has a lot of lag might have trouble. So our gear set takes advantage of this, but we don't use this solely for survivability because the high magic cost and the only six second duration means it's a lot of work to maintain this. Because remember, Ellis Goes Online has a global cooldown of one second. Meaning when I cast an ability like Purifying Light, it takes me one second for the animation to go into the next ability. So if I do an, a Purifying Light, then I do a Degeneration, and then maybe one or two sweeps, guess what's down? Living Dark. So you're only gonna get about a three ability window before you have to place this up again. It's not beginner friendly. So you have to make the decision in the gear charts I'm gonna show you in a little bit. What level are you in this Magpar? Can you maintain this buff through lag, through six people beating on you? Great, go all spell damage route. If not, go with the simple set and forget one that I use. We're gonna talk about Crescent Sweep here. This is the Adric Spear ability. You have a lot of different options. You can use Dawnbreaker of Smiting, you can use Meteor, you can use whatever you want. You can even use the two-hander hold if you want it. The reason I use this, it's dirt cheap, low cost, it hits extremely hard, and plus you can benefit from that fully charged heavy attack mechanic and hit him with a Crescent Sweep. Play around with it. Now, you also have this flex spot here, and the hybridization, uh, I tried 2H, and I tried Executioner, and Executioner worked really, really well in a duel. The reason why is if we take the skill, it scales extremely effectively. So almost, I think it's at 400 once it's leveled up, and it's a very low stamina cost ability. And you can go with the other skill, Reverse Slice. The strength of Executioner is it's not a channel. So if we go in here in Radiant Glory, Radiant Glory is a channel. And when you do this in a duel or against really top tier players, they're just gonna bash you and counter it. I think this is a noob trap. Yes, you can kill people at far away range that don't know how to counter this, but when you're actually playing against someone that's as skilled as you, that's as good as you, and they see a beam coming, they're just gonna bash you and you're gonna eat a CC because of it. So I don't see Radiant Glory on my bar, and that's why I don't place it there. But consider using the two-hand execute, dropping this skill, getting your spell power from another buff, or putting on your back bar, and then you have a really, really, really good 1v1 build. Back bar setup, pretty self-explanatory here. We're gonna have some options. One, channel focus, gotta have this. This is your armor buff, it lasts forever gives you tons of resources thing and you stand it, it gives you some heals. The heals are not that significant. So don't feel like you have to go back down and hunker down where the ruin is. That's not true. At least maintain it because it's dirt cheap. And it's gonna give you a lot of magic and your armor, which reduce damage. Next ability up, this is the flex spot. So I actually have here from uh, the support skill, lingering flare, or you can do blinding flare. What this does is it's kind of like a set and forget, really. It gives major protection just for slotting, increased damage reduction by 10% or major protection. Major and minor protection stack on top of each other. So I can get the uh, minor another way. The reason I put this on my back bar and use it now is because everyone's running Plague Break. Even magic builds are running Plague Break. So Extended Ritual is very, very good. But a lot of times if I place it and let's say I place it, I remove five negative effects and Plague Break's not one of them. Someone else in my group might just be spamming their synergy key, not where that they have a Plague Break debuff on them. We're all stacked on top of each other. Boom, everyone dies. So I found in Battlegrounds, Extended Ritual works pretty well. Um, but in Cyrodiil, not so much. It's just a noob trap that gets you killed with Plague Break a lot of the times. So I go for the... Uh, for, so most of the time, I'm fighting out number, I have much better success just using this because I'm constantly debuffed by Plague Break. And a 1v1, again, not that impactful. Soon as you're in a keep, soon as you're INC, as soon as you're stacked on top of NPCs and IC, boom, you're dead. So consider this your flex spot. If you want something else or you want to put Extended Ritual, just know, risk reward. Next ability up, and this is the movement ability, okay? So you have two choices. You can go vampire or you can go non-vampire. I've tried Vampire and I don't care for it. 
Yes, it's very, very strong due to the undeath passive. You also get some spell damage coming out of Elusive Mist, which is the skill that you would use if you want mobility. But I don't think the downsides are worth the upsides. I'm much more survivable in this form, not using Vampire and using Race Against Time for mobility. It gives you major, uh, it gives you major expedition, but really what you're trying to do is remove the snares and immobilizations. Typically a Dragonite using fossilize, using talons on you, a Sork using their immobilizations, whatever it is, you're gonna be constantly trying to be rooted, snared, stunned, immobilized, and this is your counter. Not to mention, it gives you increased crit damage too, so you can hit this and then go charge in on your front bar for increased crit damage. And there's some good passives for slotting. So I went the non-vampire route, which is what I prefer, but experiment. If you like the vampire route, and some people do, great. I just could not get Elusive Mist to activate properly like the old skill we used to and get frustrated and move on. Next ability up, you have a couple of different choices and morphs. So Rapid Regeneration. This is the selfish morph, but the problem with this is it can go to anyone. The upside of this is it has a massive amount of healing. So you need to determine what's your most important thing. If you're playing Battlegrounds, you can take Radiant Regeneration, the other morph, and heal a bunch of allies. No, it's not going to be as quick, but it's going to be very impactful. You're playing in groups, you're playing with friends, go with the other morph. You're typically playing solo, which is what I do. I just queue up solo in Battlegrounds, run out in Cyrodiil, bat, you know, do my own thing. This is the morph that I go with. If you want to always go you, check out the other morphs, and you can flex this ability. Next ability up is my burst heal, and uh, I go with Honor the Dead, because again, I'm not doing a Templar healer build, I'm just doing a solo survivability mechanism, and this thing, tooltip, is 11,000. Your lower health, it can go all the way up to 20,000 on a crit. Incredibly impactful, plus it gives you back resources. I don't rely on this as a spam cast. This is, I'm about to die, I don't know what else to do, click. You'll notice I set my bar up very specifically. My five key on my back bar, or if you're on consoles, whatever that is, and my five key and my front bar are my survivability tool. Trust me, do this. The reason why is if you do this, what your brain's not gonna have to process what bar am I on? Oh my God, what am I doing? You want it to be instinctful. So if you're in a lag fight, if you're getting pressured, you just hit your five key and you know that's probably gonna keep you alive. So if you're on the front bar instead of the back and you're trying to survive, you're not going to misclick and die. Do this for all your builds. You'll notice a lot of my builds, the five key on my back bar almost all the time is survivability. So when I jump from build to build to build, it's muscle memory at that point. It's very easy for me to execute jumping from a Necro to a Mag Warden to a Stampar, whatever. Trust me, this will change your life in whatever build you play. Okay, so for the back bar ultimate of choice, it's pretty obvious. It's life giver. This is going to be an oh crap button that is very, very cheap, but only lasts about five seconds. So just consider an important thing to note is you need to take the abilities here, max them out in the correct morphs. I was experimenting with the Ward Ally. I would not use this morph, but make sure you have them unlocked and you actually have them morphed and leveled up because it does matter. It'll apply all three of them instantly. Another thing about the Restoration Staff that's so powerful is Essence Drain. You gain major mending for four seconds after completing a fully charged heavy attack. If you don't know what else to do, do a fully charged heavy attack with your back bar on your resto. Getting major mending and then flipping over on the assault, yes, it's only four seconds, but that's the difference between survival as soon as you launch in or not. Not to mention that when you have a resto staff equip, increase your healing by 15% on allies under 30% health. So our burst heal being back on our restoration staff, that's why. And then fully charged heavy attacks restore 30% more magic. Remember the off balance? Going back to restoration staff, this is why we can sustain so well. So it's basically why you go with the Restoration Staff. It's such a back bar, uh, it's such a strong back bar weapon that even all my stamina builds have switched to this with a hybridization. Let's talk about the rotation, how this would actually work. Typically you wanna apply your um, buffs that do not require a target prior to the fight, right? So I'm gonna do my ritual pretty much always, and I can leave it and still get the buffs. As you can see, I'm still getting the armor buff in or outside of it. I just get a little bit of healing right here. So typically I'll do that, and then I'll do race against time when I'm going to go on the offensive, okay? Then I charge in. One of two things is going to happen here is usually I do living dark and there's a bunch of people that are around there. I know I'm going to take a lot of pressure or someone's focus targeting me. Then I'll probably light someone up with that purifying light and then do degeneration. Remember the fully charged heavy attack thing. Here we go. Fully charged heavy attack, crescent, throttle down, okay? 
So what typically normally happens is you basically do this, you light them up, you charge in, and you're probably gonna get stunned or people are gonna hammer you. So when that happens, preemptively use living dark before you charge in. So usually it's one, two, global, and then charge in, and I do one sweeps, quick sweeps here, two, three, it blows up, see? And then it's like a dance. You're only gonna do about three to five, maybe six seconds of attacking and then peel back, reset your buffs and do it again. PVE DPS is all about sustained pressure. I do my one key, then my five key, then I bar swap and do three and then two. No, 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 ESO is, PVP is dynamic. You need to do it like a dance where you jump in three to five seconds, pull back if it doesn't work, dance, jump back in, do the exact same thing. So jumping, peeling back, reapplying buffs and setting it up. And when you get tunnel vision, you die and you're not applying your buffs. The number one thing to keep up is living dark when you're going in the offensive. On the back bar, the number one thing to keep up is channel focus. Something that's going to help you if you're a beginner is turning your uh, health bar on when injured. So when you're taking damage, the little bar above you will show. And anytime you're about 75%, yes, 75%, you need to stop attacking and start applying your heals. I'll see people that won't heal themselves. They're at 50% health, they're at 25% health. You're gonna get one shot and killed. So as soon as you go on the offensive, if you start taking pressure, you're peeling back, you're making sure you're getting in your rune, you're applying it, you're doing your heal over time. And then really you're gonna do honor the dead, burst heal if you're at that 50, 60% or lower mark. Don't rely on that just to constantly heal you. If you're at 75%, use your heals over time like rapid and living dark to keep you up topped off on health it's only when you get 50 or below bang you're going to use honor the dead for a burst heal so if you're on your back bar you're taking pressure you got this you got some heals coming in usually i do a fully charged heavy attack if that mending it might be at 30 might be at 20 percent i hit that and i'm going to do a massive burst heal so that's how you actually play it now we're going to get to the juicy stuff which probably everyone wants to know and that's the gear so we're going to talk about gear and here's the first chart up and what I go with. This loadout is typically the most performance one you can have that gives the most efficiency out of the build. You have a five piece on the front bar active only offensive set. You have a back bar defensive only active on the back bar that allows you to use one mythic, one monster helm. So we're going to go over each of these and I'm going to give you a couple other options on what you can use. So we're going to talk about gear sets first, and we're going to go with the monster. And the obvious choice here is Magma Incarnate. I think it's the strongest out there. The one piece gives you great resource sustain. The two piece gives you minor courage, increasing your spell damage, and minor resolve, increasing your armor. It's the most efficient thing out there that you can use. So some alternatives, you don't have Magma Incarnate. Engine Guardian is really, really good for resource sustain and uh, making basically a drone decoy. Zolzi Ever Wakeful is really helpful if you're doing IC and you don't want to get Zerg down and ganked all the time, especially with the Slippery passive. It'll automatically break free and stun people in the area. Really good combo. And something for a crazy all-out burst is Valor. I typically don't use this because I'm not saving up a lot of ultimate, but if you want something more burst window-wise, that's what I go with. And then Markin's Ring of Majesty or Majesty, how do you say that? Anyway, setting on your bar, there's nothing you need to do to activate it. You're going to get 2,000 spell damage and 2,000 armor just for having it on your bar. It's incredibly impressive. Death Dealer's Fate, believe it or not, is a really good mythic. It's going to give you a lot of max stats after fighting for a minute, but it takes a minute to ramp up, which is opposite of Markin's, just set and forget. Death Dealer's Fate, really good choice. And if you struggle with resource sustain, use this here, Torque. It's great if you keep your stamina low, it's gonna give you almost infinite resource magic, which is basically what's gonna happen getting CC, dodge rolling and stunned all the time. Really good resource sustaining mythic. So the five piece front bar offensive, meaning the weapon and three body pieces I go with is War Maiden. War Maiden's all about spell damage. There's another set you can go, Deadly Strikes, which is all about damage over time. It just depends on what you want to use. The reason I go with War Maiden is number one, it's easy to get a hold of. And number two, it applies to my Purifying Light as well. So, and a generation. So all of those abilities are getting amplified versus just one or two of them per se. So War Maiden is my go-to. Go with Deadly Strikes if you want another option. Both very, very strong. But 600 spell damage on your front bar is a lot. And you can see when I'm on my front bar, unbuffed, we're at uh, 4,400 spell damage. And then we get our resistances unbuffed. And you can see our penetration here with spell pen is at 10,000 using a mace is what I have on this specific character. Or you can go with a sword if you like. 
All right, so War Maiden um, alternative flex options. Talked about deadly strikes already. You could use swords or maces, depending on what you want. It's going to increase your damage with channels. So this is really good if you want to just focus on puncturing sweeps primarily. New Moon Acolyte is a craftable set, and it's just going to give you a lot of weapon and spell damage on your front bar at active. Downside of it is it's going to increase your cost, but if you're looking for just a basic craftable option, this is a good one to go with. And an old school one that might sound a little bit goofy is Soul Shine. It's an overland set coming from Reaper's March, and when you activate an ability with a cast or a channel, it grants you weapon and spell damage for five seconds, and it applies when you go back to your back bar. Not a long duration, but something that can be an option. Now the back bar setup. So we're going to go with the five piece Iron's Blood. This is number one, the most damage reducing five piece you can have. When you take damage, it's going to reduce your damage by 30%. That stacks on top of major protection on your back bar, which stacks on top of minor protection on your back bar if you're using a skill like Temporal Guard. And it's going to reduce your movement speed. So the movement speed isn't so much of an issue if you're using well-fitted trait and you're dodge rolling and using toppling charge to either charge in or charge out. Though it does require a target. You can also use race against time to get major expedition as well. So it's not that noticeable and crippling. Plus I'm on a slow clunky magpar anyways. This is not a speed build, so I don't notice it. So Iron Blood back bar alternatives. We already talked about Olamire being one for uh, really high spell damage, but it's a little bit unforgiving in terms of survivability. Daedric Trickery is always an option. This is craftable, easy to obtain. It's going to give you major buffs. The downside is I already have some of those major buffs, so they're a bit redundant. Typically why I shy away from it on this specific Magpar build. You could always go with Mark of the Pariah. It comes from Rothgar, very, very easy setup, and what I use on my no CP setup. The downside is you're going to want to keep this on at all times, so it changes up the build's layout a little bit. And don't sleep on Grace of Gloom as a defensive back bar set. Gives you major uh, evasion, very, very tanky, and gives you some healing, though you're going to have to ramp up your HP if you want a lot of healing from this five piece. So substitutions for Markins. If you don't have any Mythics, I would suggest start working on them, or you can just do the trainee route. So instead of just having one piece trainee on the body, you can have another. Or you can switch up your build to have a monster and an arena weapon. So don't sleep on the trainee. You can buy it off the traders. You're going to have to trait change this since it comes in the training trait. The common setup and what I had been using for a while is Olimers. This is the Cloud Rest set, and you can run a Restoration Staff and run it a little bit differently, but it's very, very effective. This gives you a massive amount of spell damage, and it's pretty much 100% uptime. It's another great back bar option. The reason I stopped using it primarily is because when I'm getting outnumbered, I'm getting dogpiled in Cyrodiil and people are beating the crap out of me. If I don't get to my front bar every six seconds and apply Living Dark, I'm dead. With Iron's Blood, I can slip up, I can make a mistake, and I can still be alive. So testing them both out, I had a lot more kill potential with Olemire on the back bar, but I had a lot more survivability with Iron's Blood. So that's the loadout that I personally went with and I enjoy. So if we look at the gear chart again, I would recommend reinforced heavy in the chest and then well fitted on the other traits. Yes, I've done in pen. Yes, I've done all in pen, no in pen. And I would tell you that having a lot well fitted would be very, very wise. If you want to go three, three, and then one, that's okay as well. And then armor choices. I like the three, one, three setup. Three light, one medium, one heavy. It gets advantage of all the juicy and daunted passives, enough damage, enough survivability. Jewelry traits, make sure you get infused with all spell damage. We're going to use the Atronach Mundus Stone for uh, magic recovery and also the Restoration Staff back bar. So going all spell damage on your jewelry is a safe bet, even a no CP. Back bar, I go with the Power Trait. And then on my front bar offensive, I go with the Sharpen. You can run a Mace or you can run a 2H Sword. Just depends on what you want to amplify the most. Glyphs, I go with Prismatic in my head, chest and legs, giving me the most value and then magic in the rest. And I like the spell damage slash weapon damage or the berserker enchant on my weapon. And then I like uh, escapist poison on my back. The reason I like that is when I fully charge heavy attack, it's going to proc that extra spell damage right as I launch into attack. Some people like the reverse, having the spell damage or berserker enchant back on the rest of stuff and escapist poisons or something else on the front. Experiment with it, they both work. So here's my previous loadout that I use, and it still works very, very well. This is a more offensive type of loadout, and you're gonna have to be very, very diligent on keeping up your living dark. And it's gonna have a five piece kind marchers on the front, which is either gonna debuff their damage to nothing, or it's gonna give you major vulnerability, making you do crazy amounts of damage. 
And then it's going to have that Olimire on the back bar, giving you a crap ton of spell damage, along with Magma Incarnate and Markin's Ring of Majesty. Consider this high skill cap with a lot of damage setup. Though if you can't maintain Living Dark, go with the Iron's Blood back bar. You'll do just fine. And now what we have here is the no proc Raven's Watch type setup in Cyrodiil. So if you're not allowed to use proc sets, you're going to go with the five piece Mark of the Pariah on the body at all times. It's going to be the most damage reducing uh, five piece that you can have in the no proc CP. Then you're going to go with War Maiden on the front bar, five piece offensive set. And you're going to go with a one piece Magma Incarnate for resource sustain and then Torque. Torque actually works in no CP PVP. So this will be your infinite sustain loop. Remember that no CP PVP is all about sustain. So you'll have enough burst damage with War Maiden. You'll have enough survivability with Mark of Pride, and you'll have enough resource sustain with this. Let's talk about the miscellaneous. I'm using a High Elf, and the reason I'm using a High Elf is I think it has the best passives for the Magpar in the game. So activating the ability is gonna, with a channel, is gonna reduce your damage taken by 5%, which stacks on major and uh, minor protection, and stacks on top of Iron's Blood. You're gonna get tons of max magic and tons and spell and weapon damage. If we go to my attributes here, typically I like to run about 32 health outside of uh, PVP or inside. If you go below that, you can. If you make a mistake though, it's unforgiving. Right around 30 to 32,000, I can make a mistake and not just get one shot. And then the rest is into magic. It'll make sure you have at least 15,000 stamina or a little bit higher because you need a lot to dodge roll and CC break. And then if we buff up here, let's see what our buff stats are going to be. So if we buff up 6,100 spell damage on our front bar, and then the weapon damage uh, enchant falls off, so 5,700 plus War Maiden, which won't even show. So we're over about 66, 6,700 spell damage when War Maiden is applied fully buffed, almost that 7,000 mark. So you're going to be very survivable and do a crap ton of damage. If we go back over here, um, Atronach Mundestone for resource sustain and Clockwork Citrus Filet. If you're running out of stamina, you're not using a two-hander, consider going to Smoke Bear Haunch or Jewels of Mystery. Those are both really good food options. Champion Points. Okay, so what you need to know about Champion Points, the green tree really doesn't affect performance. If you're doing the Cyrodiil one um, PvP, I would do the War Mount and Gifted Rider. This is just my PvE farming loadout, and then Steed's Blessing. And then you have a flex spot depending on what you want. Rationer usually saves a little bit of uh, gold. Moving over here in the blue one, this is the really important one. So I'd recommend doing is having two offensive, two defensive. The best uh, defensive one here is Ironclad, reduced damage taken by direct damage. And then typically what you get killed by is heavy hitting single target ability. So Duelist Rebuff will give you a lot of survivability. Then Master of Arms, it's going to apply to pretty much whatever you do, whatever ability you do, not just the jabs. So Biting Aura is basically AOE jabs, but I go with Untamed Aggression because Untamed Aggression not only applies to the damage abilities, but also my healing and Living Dark. So the more we can ramp that up, the more survivability we have. Moving over to the Red Tree and the two no-brainers here, Balance Vitality and Fortified. And then I do Slippery. Slippery is going to give you a break free every 21 seconds. The advantage of this is during lag fights where you can't even break free, it will do it automatically. So it saves you a crap ton of stamina and it'll save your life constantly. And then you have some options here. If you're not going to use the cleanse, I would highly recommend going with Pain's Refuge. If you're going to use, um, if you're also not going to use the cleanse and you struggle with resources, go with Sustain by Suffering. Consumables I keep on me. I talked about Clockwork, Citrus, Filet. Good old Tripods are really, really effective as well. And then Escapus Poisons. These are the ones that drain resources immobilize the enemy and make you immune to CC for a brief time. Those are really good to keep on you. And then this here, the essence of a movability. So I don't need Stam, don't need a heal. This is really good when you're charging into the fight and you can expect an immediate CC. It's going to give you the crit bonus, so you don't even need to slot inner light. It's going to give you a resource sustain, but make sure you take this important passive and alchemy right here. Medicinal use. It's going to make the effect last longer. 10 seconds of CC immunity is enormous, plus 47 seconds of magic recovery, meaning 45 second cooldown, 100% uptime on this. Well, gang, that's a build. Magpar, it works. Come watch me live on twitch.tv slash gaming, where I play ESO live, interact with you, the community. You can ask questions about this build. Hope you got something out of this. I did a deep dive explaining the ins and outs and the nuances of this build. If you want me to cover something else just like this in depth, let me know. I'm coming up with my stamina hybrid DK PvP build next and also some solo PvE builds. 
I appreciate you watching. Also, if you did like this video, make sure to click that like, subscribe, leave me a comment, you know, for the algorithm. And thanks for watching.